Greetings from Pavlo Ardanov, Fulbright Research Scholar at the Agricultural Sustainability Institute, University of California, Davis, and co-founder of the NGO Permaculture in Ukraine. Welcome to the series of video lectures on designing crop polycultures, which is supported by the International Vyshegrad Fund. The topic of this lecture is intercropping and designing crop polycultures. In the second part, I will review different ecological functions that we can enhance in multi-cropping systems. The lecture is designed for the academic courses, thus it contains some advanced biological information. But it also contains a lot of practical information for growers. You can decide which section to skip depending on your preferences. Under description to this video, you will find the links to different sections of this video lecture, as well as to slides where you can study spreadsheets to design your own intercropping schemes. Arable lands under crop polycultures can help to sustain biodiversity. Study in Germany demonstrated that 38% of arable wheat species represent red list species and hedge groves in United Kingdom support approximately 150 invertebrate species from 70 families. Biodiversity conservation will not work without protecting at least 5% of remaining pristine habitats uh, and uh, diverting up to 8% of arable farmland to wildlife habitats, primarily by removing unproductive around field ages, can benefit farm product profitability. High diversity ecosystems often clearly promote important ecosystem services and are often more productive, as in case of meadow, where species rich sowing with from 25 to 41 plant species were 60% more productive than species poor sowing with only from 6 to 17 species. An ideal agricultural landscape must be a mosaic of well-connected early and late successional habitats to support a high biodiversity and thereby the capacity to recover from minor and major small and large-scale disturbances. Conservation efforts to support pollinator gifts of the uh, target rare species, uh, for example by planting early blooming plants, will also improve pollination of the agricultural crops. Let's discuss nutrient cycling in polycultures. Phosphorus assimilation can be facilitated by intercropping of phosphorus mobilizing species that can solubilize either inorganic phosphorus in soil by exudation of carboxylates or protons, or to mobilize organic phosphorus by releasing acid phosphatases. Nutrient capture and phosphorus mobilization, in particular on nutrient-poor soils with high leaching, can be associated with larger root surface area attributed to symbiosis with arbuscular mycorrhiza fungi, in particular diverse sporacea. It should be noted that different cultivars can respond differently to mycorrhiza colonization and that plants can modify their root distribution depending on nutrient availability and competition with the root systems of other uh, species. Niche partitioning can also contribute to more efficient utilization of phosphorus in soil, for example in case of intercropping of white looping and wheat that preferentially use citric acid leachable phosphorus and water leachable soil uh, phosphorus pools respectively. Cereals excrete phytosiderophores and thus can improve availability of micronutrients such as iron and zinc for non-mobilizing dicotyledonous plants, contributing to natural biofortification of food products to alleviate micronutrient malnutrition. Improving nitrogen nutrition requires integration of leguminous or fibrous rooted crops in crop rotation as cover crops or as intercrops, where legumes can supply nitrogen through mycorrhizal nutrient transfer, continuous decomposition of senescing roots and nodules, or decomposing shoots. In addition to legumes having rhizobial association, there are other family of plants and groups of microorganisms capable of atmospheric nitrogen fixation, uh, including even some native varieties of maize. In legumes intercropped with cereals, nitrogen fixation is higher than in monoculture, 
for example, three times higher for P intercropped with barley. Whereas under application of inorganic nitrogen, cereals overcompete intercropped legumes and large phosphorus and nitrogen supply can substantially reduce both root exploration uh, in soil and the atmospheric nitrogen fixation rate by legumes because of strong uh, negative regulatory feedback. In several legume species, nodulation is stimulated by mycorrhizal association. Accumulation of amino acids in nodules and ureates in leaves under drought conditions lead to downregulation of nitrogen fixation. As nitrogen is a highly mobile nutrient, it can be easily lost by leaching. In particular from synthetic fertilizers, where only about 47% of added nitrogen is converted into harvested products. Slower nitrogen release from legume residues enable better synchronization with nitrogen demand of subsequent or interplanted crop. In addition, legumes can sequester carbon in soil and they are partly capable to prevent nitrate leaching, though cereals and brassicaceae are more efficient nutrient scavengers. Polyphenols influence the rate of microbial decomposition of plant litter and tanning concentration, as well as ratio of condensed tanning to total nitrogen, are the best predictors of soil net nitrogen mineralization from plant residues. In addition, the timing of nutrient release is influenced by management factors, such as cover crop species, time of cover crop kill, and mode of residue incorporation, climate, for example, rainfall and temperature, and soil properties such as texture and pH. I have reviewed the influence of these factors in my lecture about cover crops. In order to minimize nutrient leaching and maximize carbon sequestration, the target is to increase longevity and length of root systems by planting trees, perennial crops and cover crops, as well as to diversify crop residues across time and space. Optimal resource utilization will be achieved by interplanting crops with shallow roots that will efficiently mobilize phosphorus, which is primarily located near the soil surface, with crops having so-called steep, cheap and deep root systems, which can better access nitrogen and water that are frequently found in deeper soil layers. Deeply rooted perennials are often used as interplants for so-called nutrient pumping to take up nutrients unavailable for shallowly rooted plants and deposit them on the soil surface via litterfall and throughfall, later means precipitation from the canopy. Within this group of deep rooted plants, permaculture practitioners often distinguish so-called dynamic accumulators that are believed to enrich surface soil layers with specific nutrients. There is indeed a phenomenon known as phytoaccumulation or hyperaccumulation, describing capacity of some plants to accumulate minerals in high concentration in their tissues. Yet their role in facilitating nutrient provisioning to neighboring plants still requires scientific proof. Soil organisms may be grouped to microflora, microfauna, mesofauna and macrofauna, where each group contributes specifically to important agroecosystem services, such as decomposition, nutrient cycling, bioturbation, pest suppression and reducing stress symptoms caused by drought, salinity or heat stress. Primary mechanisms include nutrient supplementation by microbes, Regulation of plant hormones either by microbial synthesis or degradation, production of toxic alkaloids against herbivores, and secretion of antibacterial, antifungal, and degradative enzymes. In addition, plants alter their metabolism as a result of sensing microbes and their products. Conventional agriculture is characterized by reduction in faunal and fungal biomass, a shift towards bacterial dominance, in particular by so-called R-selected organisms, which are adapted for rapid reproduction and dispersal. 
Reduced tillage with surface placement of residues creates a relatively more stable environment and encourages development of more diverse decomposer communities and slower nutrient turnover, favoring a higher ratio of fungi to bacteria. Soil with residues chopped and left as a mulch generally support higher population of surface-feeding earthworms. Soil unprotected by surface mulch will freeze much faster than mulched soil, and earthworm's mortality increases in the absence of gradual period of adjustment to decreasing temperatures. However, high herbicide use in no-till system can negatively affect soil biodiversity. An additional increase of microbial populations and its activity is achieved by increasing below-ground input of carbon and nitrogen through inclusion of legumes and fibrous rooted crops in rotation. In legumes, resa deposits, organic compounds deposited by root to soil, account on average 73% of below-ground plant biomass, while in cereals only 57%. Effects of crop rotation on soil organisms depend on quantity and quality of organic inputs, as well as on providing a period of biological break when no host plant susceptible to specific pathogen are grown. Crop species may be selected to favor development of beneficial soil microorganisms, for example by diversifying crop crops in rotation and uh, by reducing proportion of non-mycorrhizal crops. Recently proposed soil memory concept states that plants shape microbial community in soil, influencing both particular composition and attributes of such community, such as growth promotion and disease suppression, and that such microbial community can be inherited via crop generations as an evolutionary mechanism to promote uh, plant fecundancy and to protect their offsprings. Soil memory concept explains the phenomenon of suppressive soils, which decrease or prevent disease occurrence despite the presence of a pathogen, a compatible plant host and favorable environmental conditions. Main mechanisms of suppression include microbial production of enzymes with anti-phytopathogenic activity, which is often the outcome of competition between the pathogenic and soil microorganisms, and induction of plant disease resistance. Suppressiveness can be either general, which is a, a di uh, uh, directly correlated to robust microbial activity that prevent pathogen establishment or specific that is attributed to pathogen antibiosis by specific soil microorganisms and different soil communities can be suppressive against the same pathogen. In many cases, specific suppressiveness results from monoculture cultivation that leads to gradual build-up of the population of pathogen antagonists in soil. An example is suppressiveness against Fusarium oxysporum mediated wilt in continuous flex monoculture. Once established, such suppressiveness can sometimes persist in crop rotation if it is linked to a more diverse microbial uh, community that it attracted and supported by a diversified host availability or if mediated by persistent chemical signals that can pass through generations of different crops. As in case of suppressiveness against Fusarium sol uh, solani, uh, rot in corn and black-eyed pea intercropping. Specific soil suppressiveness can be induced by sequence of monoculture, as in case of monocropping of soybean that decreases symptoms of root diseases, or addition of chitin with feather or hoof meal that can result from plant livestock integration. Uh, and chitin increases the abundance of Lysobacter species antagonist to phytopathogen Rhizoctonia solani. General soil suppressiveness requires no-till cropping systems, which support soil microbial diversity and allow prolonged interaction time between uh, crops and soil communities, in particular because of uh, uh, progressive release of nutrients from, from crop residues to support the inherited soil community for uh, further generations, as well as reduction of pesticides, fungicides and fertilizers. 
Negative plant soil feedback, when the presence of a particular species modifies the soil community in a way that reduces the competitive ability of other individuals of the same species, is reported in natural plant communities, namely forests in eastern North America, where it can facilitate the coexistence of strong competitors and thus stabilize uh, more uh, diverse plant communities. Uh, where most species do worst in the presence of itself, comparing to heterospecific individuals. This suggests that diverse plant communities can be established by keystone competitors. In agriculture, such negative plant soil feedback contributes to overyielding in intercropping, compared to monoculture due to reducing the negative influence of soil pathogen buildup on conspecific host plant, in particular when combined with the growth promotion by heterospecific neighboring plants. Diversifying on-farm vegetation or conservation of biological pest control is a preventive method in contrast to curative method prevailing in conventional agriculture. In general, conservation biological control is focused on increasing habitat diversity and connectivity. Mixtures of different crop species or varieties, later is called multi-lines, buffer against disease losses by delaying the onset of the disease, reducing spore dissemination, or modifying microenvironmental conditions, such as humidity, light, temperature, and air movement. Certain associated plants can function as repellent, antifeedant, growth disruptors, or toxicants. In the case of soil-borne pathogens, some plant combinations and organic amendments can enhance soil fungistasis and antibiosis. Pest suppression by plant diversity is explained by three hypotheses. Associational resistance hypothesis, which is repelling or confusing host-seeking phytophagous insects, as a function of the visual or olfactory complexity of the surrounding vegetation and association with non-host, unpalatable or toxic plant species. Enemies hypothesis, providing resources for natural enemies, including habitat, nectar and alternative prey or host, to increase their abundance and dis uh, distribution among crops. And trap crop hypothesis, or using plants that repel and attract pests, often in combination. Principles of pest control in diversified farming lies in increasing genetic diversity of crops and structural heterogeneity of landscape, resource and habitat continuity to sustain populations of pest predators uh, through the periods of their seasonal activity and to support their early arrival in the season, reduction of monocultures and increasing proportion of natural and semi-natural habitats, and integration of plant crops with livestock. Mixtures of crop species and varieties are aimed to slow the pathogen spread by slowing the rate and incidence of infection via combining plants that differ in their susceptibility to pests and pathogens, improving plant health and inducing disease resistance, and by establishing more structurally complex environments. Plant diversity provides direct protection against specialized herbivores, and one meta-analysis demonstrated that half of diversified cropping systems had less herbivores, while 15% had higher herbivore number. This data demonstrate that diversity per se does not necessarily increase stability in plant herbivore systems whereas a little powerful diversity of the right kind, or plant defense guild, can be created from selected plants to reduce herbivory for one or more uh, target crop species. It should be noted that plants and landscape complexity lead to decrease of pest abundance, while pest diversity may increase, and in general, 
a genetically diverse system selects for stability and low aggressiveness of uh, pathogens, rather than uh, for super races and instability, as it is in simplified systems. The biological control agent is typically a predator or a parasite. Most known herbivorous arthropods have parasitoids. Small in size, these carnivores are natural food items for smaller arthropod carnivores, such as spiders. Plant-associated microorganisms can reduce plant pathogens by antibiosis, competition, induction of plant resistance mechanisms, inactivation of pathogens germination, and degradation of the pathogenicity of the pathogen. Interaction between different trophic levels can be quite complex, as illustrated in this example with a green uh, coffee scale. That is tended by Azteca ants and predated by larvae of a globe market lady beetle. Population size of this pest is also regulated by the pathogenic white hollow fungus. And this fungus can also attack another fungus, uh, causing coffee rust. Ants protect the tended scale uh, pest by attacking lady beetle uh, pest prey. And ant population is controlled by the parasitoid uh, uh, for it fly. All plants respond to herbivore and pathogen damage with the enhanced emission of volatile organic compounds. And composition of this blend depends on the type of wound and even the type of attacker. Plants in numerous taxa also respond with the secretion of extrafloral nectar. Both volatile organic compounds and extrafloral nectar, especially if combined, attract adult parasitoids and predators that can significantly reduce herbivore pressure on plants. Natural plant volatiles with antifungal or repellent properties can also serve as direct resistance agents and induce disease response in neighboring plants that is called defense priming. Level and composition of volatile organic compounds depends on plant species and variety. It also depends on neighbor identity, as demonstrated for red clover emission, that was higher for plants growing in interspecific competition with the orchard grass. In this study, more diverse plant community had also higher biomes. Intercropped plants can repel pest insects by releasing volatiles that repel pests, masking volatiles uh, uh, released by crop plants, or by altering crop volatiles when crop plants absorb root exudates from intercropped neighbor. In addition to volatile organic compounds, plants commonly attract and maintain carnivores by offering shelter, such as domatia in the form of cavities or trichome turfs, for ants and predatory mites or food rewards such as pollen, floral nectar, extrafloral nectar, and plant sap. Nectar-based rewards can shift the balance in favor of the third trophic level of carnivores, which are usually limited by availability of carbohydrates for reproduction at the adult stage, when carbohydrate-rich food can increase longevity, survival during prey scarcity, predatory efficiency of carnivores, or it can reduce intragill predation, even when a specific reward happens uh, to be used by uh, herbivores as well, later are more limited by the supply of proteins. Similarly, domatia are usually occupied by uh, predators rather than uh, herbivores. Certain weeds, mostly umbrellifera, leguminose and composite, play an important ecological role by harboring and supporting a complex beneficial arthropods that aid in suppressing pest populations. When nectar production by these neighboring so-called insectary plants is synchronized with egg laying by herbivore predators and parasites, the pest control efficiency of these insects may be significantly higher. Plants can also support alternative hosts. For example, wedge, wedge planted in the understory of pecan orchards 
provided aphids early in the season in orchards and thus increased convergent lady beetle population in tree canopy, resulting in better control of pecan aphids. Spatial plant arrangement in Defense Guild is defined by herbivore feeding behavior and dispersal capacity. Guild members can function as anti-herbivore resource in five major ways. As insectary plants, providing pollen and nectar sources for herbivore predators and parasitoids. As repellent plants, uh, either directly or indirectly causing the herbivore to fail to locate or reject its normal prey. As attractant plant or trap crop that function as an alternative prey for insect herbivore to protect target crop during a critically susceptible growth stage. As decoy plant uh, which uh, cause pest mortality or reduced fecundancy because of the presence of toxins or because of the absence, deficiency or imbalance of certain nutritional materials. And as nursery plants supporting alternative hosts for biocontrol bio organisms. In push-pull strategy, both repellent or push plants are intercropped with the crop of interest and attractant or pool plants are planted around the field. Ideally, the pool plant does not allow the pest to reproduce, and both push and pull plants also serve other functions, for example as ornamental plants, vegetables, spices, or as food for livestock. An example is a push-pull system to protect maize against the pest stem borer and parasitic uh, wheat, purple witch wheat with two perennial crops, legumes push crop desmodium and pool crop napier grass. Within crop field, polycultures can create more stable environment for natural enemy populations due to the more continuous availability of food sources and uh, micro, providing microhabitats. Meta-analysis demonstrate that polycultures can increase natural enemy populations on average in 53% uh, uh, of cases reviewed and uh, increase pest mortality in 60% uh, of cases. Polyculture provides particularly efficient protection against specialized herbivores, which are more likely to find and remain on pure crop stands that provide concentrated resources and monotonous physical conditions. Incidence of viruses transmitted by insects is also more predictably lowered in polycultures. Secondary hosts for pests, usually plants belonging to the same family, should be avoided or reduced when designing intercropping and rotation schemes. In cultivated areas, resource for pest predators can be increased by tolerating the presence of some weeds leaving crop residues on the soil surface that increase spider and carbid densities, and by constructing modular refugees, for example bee houses or wire baskets stuffed with straw for spiders. Ground cover vegetation with cover crop or resident ground uh, vegetation in orchards is another approach to increase within field plant diversity. For example, grass legume refugee strips were demonstrated to increase the population density of predaceous carabid beetles in corn and soybean fields. Cover crops, in particular brassicaceae and tagetes marigolds, are used for controlling parasitic nematodes, serving as non-host plants affecting nematode uh, uh, reproduction, by producing root exudates, stimulating nematode reproduction in the absence of hosts and causing nematode death, by producing uh, root exudates with nematicide properties, and by producing compounds in the foliage, which, once incorporated into the soil, have nematicidal properties. Crop rotation or manipulation of crop diversity at larger spatial scales can also improve biological control agents. For example, corn potato crop rotation in North America decreased populations of the Colorado potato beetle because its natural uh, predator, ladybird beetle, uh, moved from corn into adjacent potato field. 
In Colombia, intercropping corn with beans decreased the number of leafhopper adults by 25% and densities of the leaf beetle by 45%. Architectural complexity in polycultures can play dual role in pest control. For example, seeing a single row of sunflowers in organically grown vegetables attracted more insectivorous birds, providing perch to prey uh, for insects and refuge from the birds of prey. While sessile immature aphid parasitoid located uh, on the canopies of host plant collards that stood taller than the surrounding vegetation, intercropped parsley plants were more prone to intragilt predation. In addition, lower parsley stratum in this intercropping uh, hampered movement and hence uh, predation efficiency by earth wings which is similarly to other non-flying insects that represents the majority of nocturnal predator guild must come uh, from the soil surface before reaching the canopy of pest infested host plants whereas straw mulch provides shelter for nocturnal predators uh, spray, uh, spiders and ground beetles and hence better aphid control by both diurnal and nocturnal uh, uh, natural enemies Therefore, uh, considering vegetation complexity as well as the behavior of natural enemies and herbivorous pests is vital for designing efficient natural shelters. Insectary plants can also play a dual role in the pest control. For example, facilia strips along the edges of cabbage field attract hoover flies, which are important predators of aphid pests. Whereas other study uh, demonstrated that adjoining flowering plants provided source of energy for Lepidopteran reproduction and flight activity and hence caused increased overposition and associated damage in brassicas. Nectar or pollen availability may also divert primary ephemeral generalist predators and parasitoids from neighboring host plants which may result in reduced herbivore control in the short term. Perennial intercrops are particularly valuable for providing permanent and less disturbed habitat for pest predators. For example, adding perennial crop alfalfa into a crop rotation of annuals, maize soybean and maize soybean wheat can increase predatory arthropods. Growing mixture of varieties with different resistant disease resistance or multi-line approach is widely used for controlling pathogens in cereals. It can reduce severity of uh, uh, cereal rust and powdery mildew by 40-80%. In this strategy, resistant cultivars should be randomly placed to occupy majority of the field. Habitat management for biocontrol may occur at different scales, within crop, within farm or at landscape level. At larger scales, habitat management serves an additional important function of providing less frequently disturbed habitat, in particular providing shelter from adverse conditions such as tillage, pesticides and harvest, as well as providing a favorable microclimate for in-season and overwintering survival. One study demonstrated that predaceous carbid beetles, row beetle and spiders were absent from crop areas and found only in white flower margins uh, during the overwintering period. Another study showed that parasitoids of the European corn borer required both a source of sugar and a moderate microclimate in summer months uh, for maximum survival in corn agroecosystem. Study in Germany for parasitoids of the rape pollen beetle demonstrated that parasitism was reduced when non-crop habitats fell below 20% of the total landscape, and that the amount of non-crop habitat in 1.5 km radius of the target field was the most important variable in deter determining parasitism and herbivory. Natural and semi-natural habitats include grasslands, hedge groves, shelter belts and field margins with grassy or flower strips. 
Insectary hedge growths can be specifically designed to provide continuous sources of pollen, nectar, and shelter for natural enemies. Shelter belts from annual flowering plants may be established in the field prior to pest arrival, as natural enemies have a better chance of defending crops against herbivorous pests at the beginning of infestation. Certain habitats in the agricultural landscape may act as biocorridors to enhance a population exchange between cultivated and non-cultivated areas, and hence dispersal of many natural enemies, and to enhance the ability to track changing pest population to prevent pest outbreaks. The creation of quite small but diversified, meaning with different uh, and complex vegetation cover, non-crop habitat islands, is an efficient tool for the maintenance of or even enhancement diversity of small and less mobile pest predators, such as carabid beetles, spiders and parasitoids within arable fields. Such complex structured habitats provide numerous benefits listed on the slide. Because individual natural enemy species may require quite specific resources at different times and spatial scales, not all attempts to manipulate habitat diversity are equally efficient. Shelters may interact negatively with natural enemies in some instances by hampering their movement, as in case of dense and wide hedge growth, diverting their attack and promoting antagonistic intra-guild interactions. With 77% of domesticated plants worldwide relying at least partially on sexual reproduction, ensuring adequate pollination could increase crop yield on average by 24%. Pollination should be specifically enhanced for varieties which are less preferred by pollinators, as in case of many commercially desirable almond varieties, nectarless cultivars of melon, which needs to be interplanted with nectar-producing cultivars, male sterile cultivars of carrot, cotton or sunflower. In general, wild pollinators twice more efficient than honeybees, especially for those crops requiring bus pollination, such as tomato, kiwi fruit, cranberries, and higher crop yield is achieved in the presence of both managed and wild pollinators. Wild pollinators also alter the behavior of honeybees that tend to specialize as nectar or pollen gatherers by chasing uh, honeybees into visiting more frequently across rows, which increase pollination of male sterile rows of sunflowers intercropped with male fertile rows, or uh, which increase pollen transfer from pollinator varieties of orchard trees. In general, most plants are pollinated by variable flower visitors. Thus, a diversity of native pollinators is essential for sustaining pollination services under changing environmental conditions. Strategies to improve wild bees focus on three key resources. Continuity and diversity of floral resources at the landscape scale. Availability of appropriate nesting sites in proximity to crop fields. And refugia from hazards such as pesticides or disease. Enhancing only flowers can diminish uh, pollination services by distracting pollinators away from crops. Bees with different foraging strategies vary in their response to habitat enhancement. Increasing floral resources may lead to both pollination facilitation of co-flowering plant species or competition for pollinators. A particular plant species may even facilitate pollination for some species while compete with others. Some attractive plants facilitate their immediate near neighbors while competing with others over a larger spatial scale. Facilitation typically decreased with the distance, likely because the influence of a plant cannot exceed beyond the foraging range of its pollinators. Facilitative interactions between plants can also increase under declining pollinator availability. Staggered flowering time may also be achieved by staggered planting time, strip mowing of cover crops, and combining early and late varieties. 
as with more popular long cycle maize, which is combined with short cycle maize in the Yucatan, Mexico. Bringing natural environments closer to crops is another important strategy, as with winter wildflowers in California, that help to build up pop uh, pollinator population for the early spring mass blooming period of almond trees. Traits such as foraging distance, flight range, pollinator size and bee tongue lengths determine which pollinators can access certain flowers. In this table you can see the interaction between different traits of arthropods and linkage with the traits of plants. Polycultures may be designed to support pollination assemblages of specific crops, using plants having respective flower structure that match the body size and the structure of mouse parts of the target pollinators. There are several mechanisms explaining pollination facilitation. The magnet species effect takes place when a particularly attractive plant species with showy displays or that offer substantial resources increases local pollinator abundances, uh, thereby facilitating their co-blooming but often less attractive neighbors. The traits that magnet species exhibit are those that make the plant attractive to pollinators, such as showy displays or offering substantial resources. Magnet species first influence the probability of a pollinator entering a patch, and then, within the patch, influence the pollinator choice between individual flowers. These effects can lead to relatively small-scale facilitation between neighbors, but competition between patches. In mimic resistance, less attractive plant species improve their fitness by mimicking overall floral morphology, UV reflectance, UV spectra and nectar content of a more preferred by pollinator species. Facilitation can occur when plants growing together increase their combined floral display size by co-blooming. Many pollinators forage optimally and therefore preferentially visiting larger floral patches. Floral abundance is likely important at larger scales because it relates to the total pollen and nectar resource content of a community and therefore to the carrying capacity of pollinator populations. And density may be more important at smaller scales because it is related to the individual's foraging habit and preferences. The increase in floral diversity of co-blooming plants can lead to improved pollination services by offering complementary resources to foragers, for example both pollen and nectar, or via sampling effects. A more diverse uh, displays uh, may attract more diverse pollinators, leading to the attraction of more effective pollinators. Sequential mutualism arises when earlier blooming plants facilitate later blooming plants by increasing local pollinator abundance or improving population longevity or stability. Peachy stems and dead wood provide habitat for cavity nesting bees, including agriculturally important osmia bees. In addition, Non-co-blooming facilitation mechanisms may occur where the larva of generalist pollinator require a specific host plant. Adding more floral resources can sometimes lead to decrease in pollination of target crop. For example, large area of mass flowering crops can lower pollinator densities and negatively affect yield of pollinator-dependent crops and the reproductive success of wild plants. Co-flowering species can experience competition when their attractiveness for pollinators substantially differ. Overabundance of floral resources may also shift interaction from facilitative to competitive, and pollination rate may decrease with heterospecific pollen deposition. In addition, herbivore-resistant varieties may drive away pollinators. Pollination facilitation is greater for plants whose resources were more abundant, higher floral unit number and nectar sugar content, and more accessible being stronger between phylogenetically closer plant species that share similar flower traits. 
Study also demonstrated significant effect of color as perceived by human, as it correlates that with the UV reflectance perceived by insects. It differed between the groups of pollinators. Unlike butterflies, which sucks nectar through their proboscis, bees have tongues well suited to deal with viscous nectar, and thus they prefer more sugar-rich nectar, while flies avoid nectar-rich plant species to avoid competition with other pollinator groups. Though nectar uh, tube lens may define the sets of compatible pollinators having minimal proboscis lens. Uh, for example, beetles have a short tongue. Uh, some species are able to overcome such limitation by nectar robbing through corolla perforation or by being small enough to crawl inside uh, white uh, nectar tubes. Nevertheless, visitors of the longer tubed plants should be a subset of those visiting shorter tubed plants. For plants with shorter nectar tubes and with equal resources availability, the potential uh, uh, pollinator facilitation is lower when nectar splitting was higher or when uh, nectar is distributed among several small flowers rather than concentrated in a single uh, flower, possibly due to the high energy demand of pollinators, which require uh, particularly efficient foraging. Main direct mechanisms of weed suppression in polyculture include resource and light competition with weeds, disruption of wheat life cycles, stimulation of wheat germination to reduce soil seed bank, physical suppression by crop residues, and release of phytotoxic chemicals. Providing early, dense, and permanent ground cover using commercial and cover crops is the main strategy for wheat suppression. And crop traits linked to wheat suppression include high biomass accumulation at the early crop stage, high leaf area index and high specific leaf area during vegetative growth, rapid canopy ground cover, early vigor, high tiller density, and droopy leaves. Intercrops, for example corn legume and leek celery, can be more effective than sow crop in preempting resources used by weeds and suppressing weeds growth because a complementary pattern of resource use and facilitative interaction between intercrop components that lead to a greater capture of light, water and nutrients. Crops such as rye, barley, wheat, tobacco and oats release toxic substances into the environment either through root exudation or from decaying plant materials, later is called biofumigation that inhibit the germination and growth of some wheat species. Allopathic chemicals can also be toxic for intercropped or subsequent cash crops, as in case with certain varieties of cucumbers that suppress the growth of prosomyld. Inhibitory effect of crop polycultures on wheat growth can be mediated via a promotion of herbascular mycorrhizal fungi that in turn can suppress development of certain host and non-host wheat species. Crop diversification increases diversity of insects, birds, rodents, slugs and earthworms that consume wheat seeds, though of course these organisms can become crop pests as well. In particular, polycultures provide microsites suitable for building nests and refuges from adverse conditions. When combined with no-till, cover crop shelter a higher diversity of granivorous carbids, which play important role in natural wheat control. Some insects are known to consume large quantities of wheat seeds. For example, in laboratory condition, female field cricket uh, have been observed to eat on average 223 red root uh, pigweed seeds per day, and red uh, fire ant uh, consume seeds of several agricultural weeds that you can see on the slide. Plants growing in harsh environments benefit from the close association to stress-tolerant north uh, plants due to abiotic stress amelioration. 
Interplanted nurse plants are used, for example, to reduce crop damage from heat waves and increase water availability through shading, increased infiltration and hydraulic lift, where plant roots act as a physical conduit, equalizing water uh, potential gradient among roots uh, and deep and shallow soil fractions. In video description below, you will find the links to slides as well as references and highlights to publication cited in this video lecture. Finally, I invite growers of tree nut and fruit crops, all growers with experience in crop diversification, researchers and agriculture extension specialists to participate in one of the surveys listed on the slide. The links are also provided in description to this video. With your help, we will be able to develop free software to help farmers to design crop polycultures. We also invite you to subscribe to our Facebook page Polycultures and Permaculture, where we, sh we sh share useful information on crop polycultures from the academic publication and directly from growers. And we invite you to share your practical experience on this page. On our website, you will find recorded conference presentations, proceedings and resolution of research and practice conference Polyculture and Permaculture, which was organized in January-February 2020. Thank you very much for your attention.